Here's an idea. There's no such thing as a digital native. In his 2001 paper, Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants, Mark Prensky described a fundamental shift. He called it a discontinuity in modern students. He says that all of the technology in their lives has changed the way that they behave and maybe even their brains. He describes these modern youngins as digital natives. He writes, our students today are all native speakers of the digital language of computers, video games, and the internet. To Prinsky, all oldies generally, but many teachers specifically are digital immigrants. He wrote, those of us who were not born into the digital world, but later in our lives became fascinated by and adopted many or most aspects of the new technology are digital immigrants. Since Prensky's paper, digital nativity as both an idea and thing to call youngsters has stuck like Flick's tongue to that pole. Along with millennial, which is my favorite thing to be called ever, digital native describes a group of people who have grown up alongside or along with everyone's favorite global network of machines and technology related to it. But it doesn't just describe an age range in the way that Gen X or Baby Boomer does. It defines an age range and an intimate familiarity with technology that comes as a free side dish, like baked beans at the barbecue place of generational demarcations. For instance, last year CNN described digital natives as being defined by the technology they're familiar with. In their book Born Digital, John Palfrey and Urs Gasser wrote that digital natives were all born after 1980, when social digital technologies like Usenet and bulletin board systems came online, and they all have the skills to use those technologies. The kids with their Facebooks and their Snapchats and the YouTubles and the iPhones, they have an innate, preternatural sense about that which contains computer chips, something that anyone born before 1980 won't ever have. This doesn't make the digital immigrant clueless, by the way, it just means that they have to learn, and they might retain what Prensky calls a digital immigrant accent. Now, it's not the claims of potential differences between cognition or behavior or learning style that inspire in me a kind of sideways stank eye. Though I am generally not in favor of the argument that the internet changes us into different people. But I do have some gripey questioning eyebrows about the common assumption that there is something automatic about someone's technological expertise if they are below a certain age. I mean, there are plenty of things to get gripey about here, like the weird imperialistic twinge imparted by distinguishing between natives and immigrants. The fact that generational lines are way too broad. Even Palfrey and Gasser prefer to describe digital natives as a population and not a generation. And the weird implication that digital immigrants can never become natives. I mean, that's the point of the distinction, right? Like, wasn't the internet built by people in the age range we would readily label digital immigrant? I mean, fair enough. Vint Cerf, the inventor of TCP, might not be using Snapchat, but I think it's fair to say he's probably comfortable with modern technology. And this is the potential problem with digital nativity. It creates a common, though not always true, relationship that maybe could cause some trouble down the road. Like, if we're thinking that the kids there, the tech diviners and the chip whisperers, is there a danger in assuming that they don't need to be be taught how to computer. Because no one is born a native speaker of digital in the same way no one is born a native speaker of any language. Through context and immersion and practice, they learn. But language is everywhere, and though it may seem as though they are computers, aren't. They are very present in many cultural and social contexts, and they are a huge part of our everyday lives, but they are a privilege that not everyone has total access to. And if they do, access doesn't come prepackaged with understanding. It's kind of like how we grow up watching and interacting with media, like books, television shows, and movies, our whole lives. And you could know every line from every episode of everything from American Horror Story to Zoe 101, but that doesn't necessarily mean you understand the capabilities, functions, and possibilities of media. This baby, though, he's using an iPad. He just gets it. Never mind the fact that this is a very common object, his father's iPad that he's probably seen his dad use a thousand times and it depicts objects that he already has a familiarity with and blah 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 blah. Anyway, I'm not gonna deny that there's a difference in attitude about technology between whippersnappers and fogies. Wireless internet will always be amazing invisible magic to me. Maybe in the same way that a phonograph was to someone born in the mid 19th century. I don't know, maybe. However, if you're 13, you would be more than forgiven for just thinking, yeah, that's a thing that we have. Whatever. I wonder if that attitude really does indicate a nativitude, or nativitacity. Or furthermore, if in calling people digital natives, we're coercing comfort into knowledgeability, which are definitely not the same thing, and certainly not automatic. Chris Jones wrote for Learning Media and Technology that generational changes in attitudes towards technology are, quote, mediated by the purposeful adoption of technology by young people who act purposefully and in relation to influential institutional contexts. In other words, though it might seem natural, it's not. It's learned and maybe even institutionalized. It's no more natural than learning how to read, use a fork, or 
do the Dougie. Prensky even did revise his original idea to the much more fluid digital wisdom instead of digital nativity. So maybe the semantic divide is another expression of the long-standing reflex we have to assign distinctive characteristics to every generation. Like, Gen Xers were, like, what is the point of any of this? And millennials are whizzes with computers. I'm right on the cusp, so just give me a second while I Google to figure out what the point of all this is. What do you guys think? Are there digital natives and digital immigrants? Let us know in the comments. And since we know you're all already whizzes with the YouTubles, you know what to do. Appropriately enough, it feels as though it has been eons. Let's see what Doctor Who means to you guys. But actually, before we get to comments from the Corrections and Retractions Department, David Lowry, who we mentioned in the Thanksgiving episode, reached out to us to let us know that we got a bunch of our facts wrong as far as the NMPA versus lyrics websites are concerned. Mr. Lowry let us know that he did not work in concert with the NMPA to DMCA these websites. He rather did research and wrote a paper that the NMPA used as a starting point for their legal action. The purpose of Lowry's research, um, to which we've placed a link in the description if you want to check it out, is to collect and give context to these websites that um, are not thought to have a good claim to fair use. That being said, there is maybe one website, uh, Rap Genius, which provides additional context, but even they have settled with the NMPA, indicating that maybe they don't even think they have the best fair use case. I don't know. This is really, it's really interesting stuff, and I think that there's probably a future episode in this. So thanks again to David Lowry for reaching out to us to let us know that we got those things wrong. Um, if you want to know more about his research, you can check. We put some links in the description. Please do so. All right, now, on to Doctor Who. My and Pa says that the Doctor is someone who has seen the worst in the world, but still sees it as something that is worth protecting. And I think that that is something that we can all aspire to, that in light of all of the terrible stuff that we see, we still have this hopefulness. But yeah, that's a great, it's a good read on the Doctor. Dalen Southwell says that the Doctor for them is about a childlike wonder about the world. And I think that that's, that's the other thing that I love about the relationship between the Doctor and the companions, that they allow him to see the world anew. And I think that's, yeah, that's a really exciting part of the universe and the story. I agree. Rinos takes a slightly darker tact and says that the Doctor for them is about the loneliness of the thinking man's life and the sort of loneliness of being a traveler which I think is also, yeah, that's, you know, there is that dark side of the Doctor that you see, and maybe this is, this is definitely part of it, right? Dark past. Elliot Collins very rightly points out that many comic book characters do, in fact, go through the same kind of rebirth that the Doctor does, though. I do think that the Doctor's regeneration is different from most new comic book continuities. But, yes, fair point. Idris K points out that Time Lord is not a race, but rather a rank, and that the Doctor is in fact Gallifreyan, that is his race. Yes, I knew that. Bimel points out some continuity that suggests there could at some point be a Doctor who is not white and also not a man, and also says that the proximity to, uh, of Gallifreyans to humans suggests that there could at some point be a gender fluid Doctor. I don't know, we'll see. Adam Acronism says that whatever happens to the Doctor in future regenerations as far as his race and sex are concerned, whatever, but that he most certainly shouldn't be American. And I think I tend to agree. The Doctor kind of has to be English, right? For Rondosa, it seems like the Doctor is about um, this kind of paradox of largeness, but then also detail, and that the Doctor is this very powerful character who can, you know, strike fear into the hearts of Daleks everywhere, but that he's also this, he's a person or a, a, a being that has meaningful relationships and has all of these small details and opinions and ideas, and yeah, he's a, he's a complicated character, just like, just like the universe. For Echo Brighton, the Doctor is a kind of, is a reminder of how great humanity is, because seeing humanity in the Doctor's eyes helps you understand why he feels as though it is important to save. And I think that that is, yeah, I want to start getting a little emotional if we don't wrap this up. And on that note, this week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these people who have trained for a very long time to be as good as they are at using computers. We have an IRC and a subreddit links in the description, and the tweet of the week comes from Known Human who points us towards a fictional documentary written by Douglas Adams. You should watch it, Douglas Adams.